Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, let's go right back to where we picked up in uh, chapter 7, and we'll get down to verse 4. Now, for those of you in television, we like to announce periodically that we tape four of these programs in succession, so you'll see the same people in the same place wearing the same clothes for a whole month. But uh, it just enhances our taping situation, and we trust you understand. I'll also remember that everything is available on video, and the videos have been transcribed in little books. And then Roy here has come up with a brilliant idea. We're going to start putting our book our tape number, they're synonymous, remember. Our book and our tape number this time is 27, and we are in the second series of that tape 27, or the middle four programs. And now, right now, this will be the third program of this afternoon's taping. And uh, that will kind of help identify. Jerry, you're going to like that, aren't you? So we are presently all on our way in tape number and, tw and book number 27. This is the center segment of the four lessons, and we are presently in the third one. Okay, so much for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter I told you I'd just as soon forget about and skim around, but it is still so appropriate. It's under probably different circumstances than most of us are confronted with. <clears throat> and yet, as our society is crumbling, and as we are falling more and more into the same kind of a social fabric that Corinth was, this chapter 7, of course, is probably more appropriate than most of us would like to admit. All right, now as we drop down in verse 4, where Paul is dealing with the relationship between the husband and the wife, he says, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. But don't stop there. Likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So where does that put us? Well, it puts us on equal ground. And in the marriage relationship, it is 50-50. I know Iris and I have often said it's more like 80-20 from both sides. <laughs> but that still boils down to a 50-50 relationship. Now, of course, what Paul is talking about here is the satisfaction of the sexual needs of both parties of the marriage union. And now that is picked up then in verse 5. Since it's a 50-50 situation, the husband is to be aware of the needs of the wife, the wife is to be aware of the needs of the husband, consequently, defraud not one the other unless it's for consent. Now, what's he talking about? Now, like I said, I'm not a marriage counselor, and I don't pretend to be, but I've read a few of their manuals and so forth, and we know that one thing they warn against is never use sex as a lever against your spouse. In other words, wives are not to withhold the marriage bed from their husband in order to gain an advantage, but vice versa. And so this is what he means. Do not use the marriage relationship to defraud or to bring pressure to bear on your spouse for something that is of your own volition. So defraud not one another unless it's by consent. Now granted, other things enter in. There, there can be emotional stress. There can be physical impairment. But all things being normal, then Paul says that if it's consented, that you're going to abstain from that marriage relationship for a time, well be it, but don't do it for long because, he says, come together again. Even though you may break that for a time for whatever purpose, don't extend it. Come back together again for what purpose? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, you see what we're all up against? The sex drive is powerful, no doubt about it, and God put it there for a purpose. But 
we're not to abuse it any more than we do anything else. And so if there is a consent between the two partners to refrain for a period of time, that's all well and good, but don't overdo it. And when you come back together again, do it for the purpose lest Satan comes in and tempts one or the other, of course, then to go outside the marriage relationship. All right, and then he says, verse 6, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And then he says in verse 7 something that throws a curve at a lot of people. When Paul says, I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this matter, another after that. <clears throat> now we know that once Paul began his apostolic ministry, from all scriptural indications, he was alone. But my whole premise is that he had at one time been married and had children. Now the reason I say that, and I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 26, and I try not to just bring things out of the woodwork, but I want to be able to back up what I teach from the scriptures. And back in Acts 26, we see a very revealing part of Paul that too many people ignore. And they just think that he was a bachelor who had never married, and consequently he had a thing against women, and uh, he had a thing against marriage. No, he didn't. But he was certainly alone at the time that he starts his ministry as an apostle. But Acts 26 now, he rehearses his past life when he was active in Judaism, and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, remember, and he was persecuting the believers in Jerusalem who had become followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and he was trying, you remember, to stamp them out, and he thought he was doing God a favor. All right, now you pick that up in Acts 26, verse 9. I verily, he says, thought with myself. Now remember, he's telling these people his conversion on the road to Damascus and so forth. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth as a religious fanatic, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they, these believing Jews, whom he had arrested and brought back before the religious leaders of Jerusalem, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice, the King James, and a better word is vote. And I gave my vote against them. Now, who was the ruling body of Jews that would have been voting what to do with these believers? The Sanhedrin, or the Sanhedrin, how you want to pronounce it. Now, here's where I maintain the man was married. You could not, if I understand the Jewish Old Testament economy, they could not be a member of the Sanhedrin unless they were married and had children. And the purpose, of course, how can you judge in the areas of family relationships if you've never had the experience? Now, that's nothing new. Bring it all the way now into the New Testament, into 1 Timothy. All the way back to Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 3. And Paul carries it right on into the leadership of the church. The same premise. How can leaders of the church lead intelligently and from experience if they've never had the responsibility of being a husband and a father? All right, look what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, and here's one of these places I always ask people, I don't care what denomination you're from. I don't care what you think of the Apostle Paul. Where do you get the reasons for your church government or organization? Well, you get it from Paul, whether they like to admit it or not. And here we have it. We have the qualifications for a pastor or a bishop and the deacons. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. This is a true saying. If a, if a man desires the office of a bishop, and I think that is also the pastor, he desireth a good work. A bishop or a pastor then must be blameless the husband of one wife, 
vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. In other words, he can't be an alcoholic. No striker, can't be a brawler, and not covetous. And then verse 4, what is the other part of his requirement? One that ruleth well his own house, having his, what does the book say? His children, see? Having his children in subjection. And you come on down to the deacons, and it's the same thing. So this whole process of leadership in the realm of the Spirit demanded that Paul was married, had children. What happened to him, we don't know. I would like to think, and I may be as wrong as wrong can be, but I like to think that after his conversion on the road to Damascus, and it just totally upset his whole apple cart of life, so to speak, and he turned his back on that well-paying position as a member of the Sanhedrin, as a member of the Pharisees, and you know he says in Galatians that he profited in the Jews' religion. In other words, he was making, I think, big money as one of the religious leaders of Israel. And he turned his back on all that. What do you suppose his wife and kids did? I think they rebelled at the very thought of it, and she probably left him or divorced him or whatever. We don't know. That's all just my own, uh, my own idea. But whatever, I have to feel that Paul at one time was married and had children, but something happened to him because from the time that we pick up the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, he is alone. He doesn't call himself a widower. He doesn't call himself a bachelor. He just knows that he does not have a wife or family. Now then, coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's that single state then that Paul is referring to when he said, I wish all men were even as I myself. Now there had to be a reason for the man to say that because he certainly was not putting the, the kibosh on marriage and family. But all through Paul's letters, what was he expecting to happen at any moment? Well, the Lord to come. And on top of that, I think that by, by the sovereign grace of God, Paul had a little bit of a foreview of the horrible persecution that was going to come upon the Christians. Now then, if all of a sudden persecution was to fall, how much easier it would be for people to be single. Stands to reason. Where a poor little wife wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of her husband being taken away in the middle of the night. Or having children suddenly kidnapped away from them and not knowing what happened to them. It'd be better to just be alone, face persecution, face the death, and have it over with. And so I think both of these things have to be brought into our understanding of what Paul is teaching here, that number one, the Lord's coming, he thought, was at hand. Paul says that throughout his letters, that the Lord was coming imminently. And of course, it didn't happen. And so he tempers these relationships with that in view. Plus, like I've already said, he had an inkling, I'm sure, of the horrible persecution that was going to be coming across the Roman Empire. So take all that into consideration. Now then, verse 8. I say therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. There again, he's telling even the women, it would probably be more comfortable, it would be better if they would remain single than to get involved again and go through the trauma of losing their husband to the forces of persecution. But, He's going to give them an out. If they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now what's he talking about? Well, if they cannot control their sexual desires, and it gets to the place that they're tempted to commit adultery to do that, then Paul says, you're better off getting married. That comes right back to what he says up in verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid immoral circumstances or the temptations of it, you're better off getting married. But that aside, he said, it's better that they stay single under those circumstances. 
Now then we come down to verse 10. And this is difficult. And I know that a lot of people probably don't like to face this head on, but we have to because it's in the book. But I'm going to, I guess I can use the word again, I'm going to temper it somewhat by assuring people that even though we are guilty of the sin of adultery by virtue of remarriage and so forth, yet every sin is forgivable. There is nothing that the Lord will not forgive. But again, I think society as a whole, and especially the Christian community, has to understand how God looks at these things. And that's what we have to go by. How does God look at it? Not what society thinks, not what our denomination thinks, but what does God say? And again, like I said in the last program, the problem with our whole attitude towards marriage amongst our young people is because they have not been taught what God says about this marriage relationship. All right, verse 10. And so unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. So this is the word of God. Let not the wife depart from her husband, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to the husband. And let the husband, by the same token, not put away his wife. Verse 12, I'm going to come down a little way, and then we're going to come back. But to the rest I speak, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell him, let him not put her away. And the woman who hath a husband that believeth not, in other words, he's still in paganism, he still worships his idols, and if he be pleased to dwell with her who is now a believer, then let her not leave him. Stay with him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by that wife who is a believer, and vice versa, an unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, and now they are holy. All right, now verse 15. But if the unbeliever, the man or the woman steeped in idolatry, has not yet become a believer, and if that believing partner departs, Paul says, let him or her go. Got it? Let her go. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. But now here's verse 16 where I want to stop. For what knowest thou, O wife, who is a believer, whether thou shalt save thy husband, who is still in idolatry, or how knowest thou, man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, of course, we know that we cannot save our spouse, and the spouse cannot save us. So what's Paul talking about? Well, bring you, let me bring you back again to Peter's little epistle. Little letters of Peter. I think I want chapter, yeah, 1 Peter, honey, 1 Peter, chapter 3. Now again, let me recap. Here in especially the city of Corinth, And this is the only letter where Paul deals with these things, and so consequently I have to feel that the Ephesians weren't under this kind of situation, the Philippians weren't, the Colossians weren't. To a degree, yes, but not like it was in Corinth. It was just beyond comprehension. And every one of these converts of Paul had been in idolatry. And if they were married, then naturally they both were. So if one of them is saved and comes out of it and becomes a believing Christian, then here we have this division in the family now. One is still an idolatry and the one is a believer. How are they going to handle it? Those of you who have had contact with missionaries, they have to deal with the same thing. If they're working amongst polygamous type people and a husband is converted and he has four or five wives, how are they going to handle it? Well, it's not easy. Because in any culture, if those excess wives are sent out away from the husband's roof, invariably, in order to stay alive, in order to get enough food to feed themselves, what do many of them end up doing? Prostitution. And so you'll have to always take all these things into consideration. And it's not easy. See, we're, we're so immune to all these things. We've been so... Uh, what shall I say, we've been so protected in our American society. But these things were real to these people. 
All right, now look what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Who does that sound like? Wasn't well, that exactly what Paul said? Sure, now Peter is saying, be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, in other words, they're not a believer, that they, the wives, may without the word, in other words, without preaching at them, without dragging them to church, without bringing them under the television ministry, that without saying a word, that lost husband may be won, not by preaching, not by nagging, but how? By the manner of living, is the other word for conversation, but that he might be won by the manner of living of the wife. Now verse 2, that while they behold your chaste manner of living, coupled with fear, now that's not the kind of fear that we think of being scared to death, but a reverential fear, who's adorning, now speaking of the believing godly wife, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating or the braiding of the hair and the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but instead let her win the husband by the hidden man of the heart. Now we're using that as a generic term again because we're dealing with a believing woman. That that which is not corruptible, that is that that born-again spirit within that believing woman, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is a great price. All right, what is, what is Peter admonishing the believing wife to do? Listen, don't nag that unbelieving husband. Don't preach at him. Don't try to drag him to church because that's not going to work. So what does she do first and foremost? She lives an exemplary Christian life in front of him. I've got a, a, I've got a pet experience. I, I don't like to use too many of these because the book speaks so much louder than anything I can say. But you know, when I was teaching up in Iowa, I had a Saturday night young people's class. Hey, I got time enough. I had a Saturday night young people's class, and we had 45, 50 kids come in every Saturday night. And uh, one time, one of the ladies who lived catty corner from the home that was hosting us, said, well, what in the world is going on in your house on Saturday night? And so Gladys said, well, we have a Bible study for young people. Well, she said, is there any chance that I could just come and sit off in the corner someplace? And she said, sure, there's no problem with that. So this lady, she was a doctor's wife, had a lovely home, and she had a husband that was something else. And they wouldn't mind my telling it. I mean, they tell it all over the country themselves now. But she came to that class for young people and over a few weeks' time, and uh, Mary Beth was saved, gloriously, came to know the Lord. Well, it wasn't but a few weeks after that, and Iris and I were attending a wedding where she also was, and this was 60 miles down the road, so I've been driving a long time to these classes. And so we went to a wedding, and she met us out in the lobby of the church, and she started to weep. I mean weep. And I said, what in the world is the problem? And she said, my husband, John. And I said, yeah, I've heard about John. <laughs> I mean, he was something else. Uh, he had more than one mistress, and she knew it. And as a result of her salvation, he became her number one burden. And I guess I happened to have a New Testament in my suit pocket. It was at a wedding. And so I showed her these two or three verses. I said, now this isn't going to be easy, but I said, my Bible tells me that if you can do it, God will do it, which is I'm willing to try. Now, about that time, I think the book was out, somebody had written that, you know, the wife should meet the husband at the door with some seductive negligee and all that bunch of baloney. And I said, just do what you know John likes. If he loves a good T-bone steak, have one ready once in a while. If he likes hot apple pie, have a pie ready when he comes home. Like I said, he was a physician. Well, to make the long story short, you know how long it took? Four months. Four months. And old John told the story himself. So that's why I say I don't mind putting it on television because he wouldn't mind. 
He said, I was in my office. He was a physician. He said, I was in my office one Sunday morning, and he said, I had just seen my last patient, and he said, I was in a hurry to get out to the country club, and he said, I was just going to spend the day boozing it up with my buddies. And he said, before I got out of my clinic, he said, the Lord just came on me with such conviction that my wife was such a far better person than I could ever hope to be. He said, right there in my office, I dropped to my knees and I said, God, I'm a sinner, save me. And he says, he did. And you know, the man has, has been a church leader almost ever since. That's what I say, I don't mind repeating it, even on television. He is a living example of what a believing wife can do without saying a word. See, most women get the idea that they're going to drag him to church and they get everybody trying to collar him, and hey, that's not the way to do it. You just simply prove to that. I've got quite a few like that. On, on one of the other instances, it was the other way around. The husband came to the class first and was saved. And got such a burden for his little wife. And she tells it. So, I mean, I don't mind. She tells it herself. She had nothing to do with it. In fact, she used some pretty vile language concerning the Word of God when he tried to read it to her. But he just kept living the example. And then finally one day, the Lord in his sovereign grace caused a friend of hers who was a believer to just stop in for coffee one morning and in the process of having a cup of coffee, led this lady to the Lord. And they're still living the exemplary Christian life together today. So I know it works. All right, now then this is all that Paul is saying, that if a wife or a husband finds themselves still in a marriage relationship with a rank pagan unbeliever, hang in there. Paul says, don't break up the marriage if at all possible, but live the example so that the day will come when they will open their heart to the gospel and then you can have, again, a happy marriage relationship a happy home, and of course, then the children will more than likely follow suit. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1. Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.